Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Photography Evangelist here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you once again on my favorite day of the week, Masterclass Friday. Masterclass Friday, for those of you who are new, is the dedicated day for the Adobe Evangelist to stream their favorite disciplines, their, their disciplines that they're known for, graphic design with um, Paul Tranny, photography with myself, Terry White, um, motion and video with Jason Levine, uh, UI, UI UX design with, um, with Howard Pinsky, and digital painting and digital drawing with Kyle Webster, and of course Katrina, our new CCX, or uh, I should say Creative Cloud Express, or Adobe Express Evangelist. That would be the proper name, Adobe Express. So I see people chiming in from all over the world, including early morning, I guess, in New Zealand. Uh, welcome Stefan over on Facebook and MD Artful over on LinkedIn. Great to have you all here and great to see you on the various platforms, including the main pl platform that we'll be you know, talking to today, and that is Adobe Live over at b.net slash Adobe Live. So even if you are going to continue watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you are, that's cool. You can hang out there and I will try to pay attention to that separate chat as well. But the main chat that I'm going to focus my attention on is the one over at b.net slash Adobe Live. So if you want to, if you have a question that doesn't seem to be getting answered, make sure you uh, head over there with your free Adobe ID, log in. And then um, I will more than likely see the question there. But even if I don't see it, because, you know, I do get get involved with the demonstration. Um, if you, it hasn't been answered in a while, just post it again. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not missing you on purpose. It just there's a lot of chatter that goes on between members or between viewers. And a lot of times I don't ever re I don't recognize it as a question. All right. So with that, and sometimes the moderators and the um, people in the chat will also recognize your questions like Sam Peterson's there as our moderator. So uh, Sam may see your question, and answer it as well. All right. With that said, today is a day that I, I haven't done. I don't, I don't know if I've ever done it on the masterclass, but we, we oftentimes get so caught up in the new releases and the new features and making sure you know what those are that we don't like once we once a new update comes out we show you the new feature and then we kind of just like continue on and then the next new update comes out and we show you those new features and we just continue on without ever really going back and just like recapping some of the best features that have been around maybe maybe they're new maybe they've been around for years maybe they've been around for six months whatever it is just our favorite features, in my case, across the board with Photoshop and Lightroom. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. So this is not a, this is what's new. This is a, this is what's cool. Like these are, these are some of my favorite features of all time. Some of which are new, some of which are old, some of which are in the middle. So with that said, um, I'm going to pay attention to the clock and I could easily get carried away in Lightroom or Photoshop but I'm gonna try and split the time evenly. So at the, at the bottom of the hour, at 11.30 my time, 8.30 Pacific time, I'm gonna switch over. So in other words, even if I'm not done, I'm definitely gonna make the case to switch over so that both sides of the equation, Lightroom and Photoshop, get equal time. And, um, and Lightroom's gonna get a little bit less because we're four minutes into it already. But anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, let's turn that off, let's switch over. We're in Lightroom Classic, and I do have Lightroom open as well. We'll be talking about um, doing things in both. So um, Lightroom and Lightroom Classic should also get a good, um, a good fair amount of exposure to each side. So whether you're on Lightroom or Lightroom Classic, let me switch back to Lightroom Classic. There we are. Um, you should be able to see some things that are favorites in either one. And some are favorites in Lightroom Classic that don't exist in Lightroom. Some are favorites in Lightroom, just the way they're implemented that don't exist in Lightroom Classic. So I have favorites in both. All right, so with that said, uh, let's dive into the first favorite, which is in both. It is in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. It's one of my favorite things. I use it all the time. Every single time I open a photo to edit it, I use it all the time. So it's one of, that's why it's a favorite feature and that's why it's number one. When I go into the develop module, 
um, I can start to look at a photo and say, oh, it's overexposed, it's underexposed, the highlights need to be raised, the shadows need to re re be re raised, so forth and so on. Maybe it needs a little of this, maybe it needs a little of that. But what I always do is let Lightroom have the first crack at it. In other words, I let Lightroom decide what it thinks it needs, and then I'll make adjustments to my liking. So that way, instead of me having to go in and touch every single slider to get it where I want, I'll just go over here and my favorite first new feature in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic is Auto Tone. So I'll go ahead and click Auto, and that will start the process. Again, Auto is almost never a, I, I click it and I'm done. It's a starting point. It gets most of the sliders engaged, and then I go tweak the ones that I think should be a little different than what Auto picked. So auto is my head start to every photo I edit all the time because you can't go wrong with auto. Even if you didn't like it, even if you hated every single slider it moved, undo. If you want to do it from scratch, do it from scratch. All right, so um, that's where it is in Lightroom Classic. And if I were to pop over to Lightroom and let's grab a different photo and do the same thing, uh, we go to edit and there's the auto at the top there, which looks like it's already been done on this photo. So let's go ahead and reset. Oops, hang on. Go back and reset this photo. There we go, reset the edits. And then we'll go ahead and click auto. And again, auto tone does just that. Now again, like I said, that doesn't mean I, I agree with everything it did, but I agree with most of what it did and I only need to tweak the things I don't like. All right, so if we go back here, the only other thing I would tweak on this photo, well, the main thing I'll tweak on this photo first is the white balance, because I can see a little bit of warm color up here in the white background and it shouldn't be it should be white so i'll just click that with my uh, white balance eyedropper to fix the white balance in the overall photo then i would go from there and keep tweaking so auto tone i'm not gonna this is not an editing class i'm not going to keep tweaking this photo but auto tone is definitely my first favorite feature that i use all the time whether it's lightroom or lightroom classic my second favorite feature in lightroom and Lightroom Classic and Camera Raw for that matter, is um, the new masking. This is uh, internally we refer to this as masking 2.0 because if we go back to masking uh, 1.0 or 1. Point whatever, it was all manual, meaning if you wanted to use the adjustment brush, you use the adjustment brush manually to mask out a part of the image every single time. You use radio filter, you use graduated linear filter, you use all those different manual ways to do it. Well, the new masking is so phenomenal that I could never imagine going back to doing it the, the previous way. So what I mean by this is there's a masking icon, again, both in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Here it is in Lightroom Classic. I click the masking icon and I still have all the manual ways to do it. So I can still do it manually as I always did, but these two, at the top, change everything. This is the new AI, um, AI, well, that's the best way to put it, AI tuned masking feature. So for example, if I wanted to select the guy here or the main subject of the photo, I just click select subject and boom, he's masked. Now, again, think about this. If you wanted to do that before, you grab the brush and you literally painstakingly paint every single edge, every single little bit of the guy. And so instead of one click, it would take me minutes. To, I had to zoom in, make sure I've got a lot of detail. Now, even with select subject, because AI based means, doesn't mean perfect every time, it missed a little piece in, inside of his cupped hand that he's hanging down there. Like it, 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 it grabbed that instead of leaving the background alone. And one of the bags he's carrying did not get selected. Now I know this already because I've done this image before, but let's say I didn't know it. One of the other favorite features is that because you can do select sky and select subject that are AI based, you can use those as a jump off point so that you can get what you really want. Because I don't really want to select him in this case. What I really want is to select the overexposed, blown out city market that he's in, the background but it's much easier to select him and then click invert to select everything else but him. That way, I don't have to painstakingly paint everything else to get it all selected. Now I just go ahead and say invert, and now I can say, oh, I can see the bag didn't get selected. I can see his hand uh, uh, selected part that it shouldn't have selected. 
So each mask, and we can go ahead and name this mask. We can call this the guy or the background in this case now, because it is the background. And I could say, oh, well, let me add to that mask or subtract from it. So if I hit add, then I can use any other method that we already discussed to add to this mask. So if I choose add with a brush, because I don't mind brushing a simple thing, this is easy just to brush the bag as opposed to the whole thing. Then I can go ahead and brush the bag. I have auto masking turned on. So that way, hang on, let me go ahead and turn that off for a second to get going here. Sometimes this takes a second to catch up. Wait, did I, did I do that right? No, hang on, sorry, 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 my bad. This was user error, sorry. There we go, let's go ahead and subtract using the brush, that's what we want. Turn off, that's gone, there we go. <laughs> I had it backwards, I hit add, because I want to add on the other one, this one subtract. All right, there we go, subtract. That's why it wasn't doing anything because the bag's already selected. So I, I was I forgot that I had inverted it already. All right, so anyway, now we got the bag subtracted. Now we want to add <laughs> in the part under his hand. So we will go ahead and click add again. So add this time is the right way to do it. And we're going to go ahead and hit our um, brush size to make our brush really smaller. I can go ahead and grab a stylus and we can go ahead and just literally paint inside of his hand there to kind of deselect that little piece inside of his hand. Okay, that's it. I'd zoom in and do a better job, but you got the idea. So now the subject is the background because we selected the subject, we inverted it, we added and subtracted the two pieces that were missing or didn't get selected properly. And now we got the background selected perfectly. So now with the background selected, I can do anything I want. I can go ahead and, for example, just lower the exposure of the background to make him stand out a little bit more. I can really lower it down, but anyway, you get the idea. Lower the background. I don't want to lower it too much because instead what I want to do is use a little bit of dehaze. So the dehaze will make that background nice and rich. So the colors that are really there and really make my subject stand out. This is the kind of stuff that Again, if you were to do this in Lightroom a year ago, it would have been, yeah, a year ago, because it was October. So more than a year ago, <laughs> it would have been extremely time consuming. Not necessarily painful, but definitely time consuming to do just those couple clicks, little brushing, done, and away I go, as opposed to having to brush the whole thing. So masking, the auto masking, Select sky, select subject, and then all, of course, the other masking that we already had is just phenomenal to have this um, in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Okay, next one on my list is super resolution. This is one that um, would have taken, uh, again, you would have either had to go buy a third party plugin. Topaz comes to mind, or you would basically just not get the same results. <laughs> so what I'm referring to is with, with super resolution, I have a small old photo here that's, on, that's less than a megapixel. It's 776 pixels wide by 676. It's an old, old, old family photo. Someone sent it to me, and that's the resolution they sent it to me in. And if I were to um, look at this photo in loop view, it's it's old, it's a Polaroid that someone scanned in or whatever. It needs a little retouching, but even before I get started, the resolution needs to be higher. Like I really want this to be a better, higher resolution photo. So with super resolution, you can take any image and literally duplicate the resolution with, any, with zero loss in quality. That's the main thing. You always have the ability in Photoshop to up-res photos, but when you up-res photos, you always gave up something. You always gave up on the sharpness or you always gave up on the, the quality of the image. It wasn't as good as what it, what, what it looked like small. It would give you the higher resolution, but just wouldn't look exactly the same. Now it does. So if I right click on this photo and I go to enhance, and again, this is in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic and Camera Raw. If I were to go to enhance, uh, super resolution is already selected and it estimates the time is going to take about a second to do this. And I can even stack it with the original if I choose to. But I'm going to keep it unstacked. And I'm just going to go ahead and say do it. There's a progress bar in the upper left corner. It will make a brand new DNG raw file next to this old JPEG that I can now work on. 
And you might say, well, can I do it again? Can I do it again? Can I do it again? Can I like keep duplicating it until I get it up to, I don't know, 20 megapixel, 40 megapixel image? Yes and no. Um, like if you try to do it now, it's going to tell you you can't. So if I were to go and enhance and say, oh, do it again, it's going to tell you it's already been done. So it's not going to let you do it. But there's ways around this. I could export this out, import it back in. And then I get a, that, like if I export it out as a JPEG and bring it back in, then it doesn't know it's been enhanced. Then I could do it again. So there are ways to do it, but by default, it's going to it's gonna limit you to double, not to quadruple or more. Uh, so if I were to now look at this, there's the, the up, up-resed one, and here's the original. Again, I'm toggling back and forth between them. You can see me doing it. Maybe you can't. If I switch over here, there we go. You can see me doing it in the film strip down there. I'm literally toggling back and forth between them. And they look pretty much identical. Like there's no loss in quality whatsoever. So uh, for your old photos, for your, your, your web quality photos, the ones that were sent to you that you had no control over, that you didn't get to scan, that whatever, you can now go ahead and just easily up-res those. All right, uh, next up, let's go ahead and, um, so Sean's asking how many times can you use Super Res to look bad? I've only done it four times and it looked the same. So I'm sure there is a point of diminishing returns, but I haven't hit it yet. Anyway, next up, my list. Let's go to Lightroom. Oh no, we're gonna uh, stay in, in uh, Lightroom Classic for this one. So I am running on a uh, M1, max macbook pro so this is uh the new apple silicon uh computer and although lightroom lightroom classic and photoshop have been optimized for which is another, another one of my favorite features they're all faster they're all been optimized for the new apple silicon one of the features has not been optimized yet and it's tethering so tethering is one of my favorite features but I'm just giving you a heads up before i can show you tethering which i have my camera here so tethering, I have my camera. Um, this is a Nikon, Nikon Z62, and I've got a long tether USB cable tied to it. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what tethering looks like. So let's go to tether capture, start tether capture. And it's giving me that, hey, tethering has not been uh, updated to be uh, M1 or Apple Silicon native, so it's gonna relaunch temporarily relaunch Lightroom Classic into, and that's Lightroom behind it, uh, into um, Rosetta mode, and then it will uh, let tethering work. And then once you quit and relaunch Lightroom again, did it do it? Let's try it again. Once you relaunch and relaunch Lightroom again, there we go. It will be back to native um, M1, M, uh, native, native apple silicon mode again all right so i'm going to just call this one mc for master class and i'm going to go ahead and set this to um, the first photo and then i'm going to go ahead and just say to add these to a collection and we're going to add them to the same collection we're already in so let's get out of current work let's go to demo Let's go to all the way at the bottom here, photography masterclass, and then we're going to do favorite features. There it is. So we, we're going to put them in the same collection, and we're going to say OK. All right, so now it's saying, OK, I'm ready. Turn the camera on. And once I turn the camera on, it should connect. Famous last words. There we go. It connected. And um, it shows me the settings on the camera. And I'm going to go ahead and change one more setting because I'm working in low light here and change it to auto ISO. And um, I'm ready to go. So now I can go ahead and point at my subject over there and grab my first shot. And there it is. And I can go ahead and look at this full screen. And there's my uh, tethered shot directly from the camera over USB into Lightroom Classic. And this is probably right up there as, as almost my number one favorite feature because it's a feature I use all the time in studio. Of course, I'm not really set up for this in my live streaming studio, but over there, 
my photography studio, I'm shooting my subjects all the time in tethering so I can see it on a big monitor. I've got a nice 27 inch monitor mounted vertically so I can see my portraits nice and big and I can see any adjustments I need to make. So for example, I might, um, let's try this one more shot here. All right, I took three more shots and they're coming in almost as fast as I take them. And it's just, it just changes my world to let me have the ability to see my shots as I take them on the computer and they're actually on the computer. So for example, if I were to get out of this, those are the raw files from the tether capture uh, and they're in their native format and they've been brought into the computer. They're on this hard drive. They're now in that collection we were already looking in as well, but here they are. And one more thing, hang on, I'm not sure if this is going to work on this one, but let's try it. They've added the ability to do live view so that you can see it before you snap it on the computer as well. So live view, capturing, tethering, definitely one of my favorite features. And this is a Lightroom Classic exclusive. So Lightroom does not have the tethering capability at this point. So to get out of this, and by the way, I can even change the settings here. So if I wanted to make my changes while my camera is like on a tripod or whatever, I can do that. I can change everything. And then I can go ahead and even press the shutter and that will go ahead and fire the shutter and bring that shot in as well. So tons of just, I love, love, love tethering. All right, I'm gonna get out of tethering, close that. There we go, turn the camera off, put the camera down, head back to our collection where we were. Let's get out of the folder. Let's go here. There we are. And there's those four or five shots we just took in their, um, in their native NEF raw format. Uh, and of course I can do anything I want to them now because they're actually on the computer. Did your tethered images use import presets? I could have set up import presets, but I didn't. So yes, you can. Where are they, where, where on the hard drive are the files? Let's go back to the tether window and I'll show you how to set all that up. So when you go to tether capture and start it, you're deciding where they're going to be on the hard drive. You're picking that folder right here. You're deciding uh, any presets that are going to run. I know that's renaming. Sorry. You're deciding any presets. Where are my presets? Where am I? I'm not seeing this. You can decide. Oh, I'm sorry. When the import dialog, when the, hang on. <laughs> it's when the tether window comes up. That's where it is. So I go ahead and turn this on. You're just going to see the floor. But you also are choosing your develop presets here. So you can choose where they go, the develop presets, renaming, what collection they go in, all of that during the tethering process. All right. So that's how it all works. Cancel and away we go. And let's go back to this. See if I got all the questions. How would I get the tether? Uh, Rodney, I just answered that. So how would I get the tethered images to my external hard drive? You could tether directly to your external hard drive. Because again, in that window, you're going to pick where they go. So you pick the external hard drive. That's where they're going to go. Is tethering what allows you to look at your photos remotely? No, tethering is not what allows you to look at your photos remotely. Tethering is what allows you to look at your photos while you're standing there connected to a cable. What allows you to look at your photos remotely is syncing them. Um, in my case, I, I've got them in this collection, so they've been synced to the cloud as I'm taking them. And so, for example, if I were to switch over to the iPad, which is right there, they're already right here on the iPad. So I could, uh, someone could be looking at this 500 miles away on a iPad that's looking at that shared collection that I'm tethering to. So that's how you would look at them remotely is by syncing that collection to the cloud. All right, make sure I got any, any other questions here. Da, 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 da. Lightroom does not have tethering per se, but I connect my iPad Air with my camera, with my tether. Uh, copies for okay <laughs> um all right let's uh continue on next 
We're almost we got five minutes, so let's just whiz through a few more of these. Um, AI-based search. All right, so let's switch over to Lightroom. Let's get out of this image. There are the, by the way, the same images came over. And now let's go ahead and take a look at, let's take a look at this and let's go to all photos. All right. Uh, when you do a search in Lightroom Classic, it can only search for the metadata that exists. So it can search for the, uh, the metadata if you put in keywords. It can search for, you know, exif data, like what camera you use, what lens you use, so forth and so on. But since Lightroom is syncing your images and backing them up to the cloud, it can take advantage of our, our Adobe Sensei, our AI-powered search, to search for things you've never keyworded. So for example, if I search for waterfall, I've never keyworded a single photo waterfall, but there are all my waterfalls. Because waterfalls are what, it, it knows what a waterfall looks like. So it can go find all my waterfall images. And it may find some images that aren't waterfalls because AI makes mistakes. But as long as it, I don't care if it found my 100 waterfall images and 10 images that were cars. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about the 10 images that were cars as long as it found the 100 waterfalls because I could just ignore the ones that aren't waterfalls. The main thing is for it to find things that exist that I never, um, never keyworded. So same thing, if I were to get out of that and I were to choose mountains, mountains, and it shows me all these mountain images that I've never keyworded. So having the ability to search for things that are not keyworded in any way whatsoever, just based on what the image looks like, will help photographers from now on, especially amateur photographers that don't keyword, or people that just never got into keywording, uh, have the ability to um, go ahead and find those images that they otherwise would not have easily found, especially if you're not a very organized person. All right, so I see a couple questions. Uh, is tethering still Canon and Nikon only? As far as I know, there are other companies that have plugins. So there, um, I think Sony has a plugin. Tether Tools has plugins that go into Lightroom Classic that let you tether other brands. So, I, and those plugins are free from what I can tell. All right, uh, next up, let's switch back over. So that was AI-based search. Let's do one more or two more. This is one that's near and dear to my heart. I do it all the time. When you take photos of cityscapes, buildings, um, skyscrapers, anything, if you're not far enough away, meaning if you're like right near it and you point up and photograph it, you're gonna get this. You're gonna get this issue where the buildings actually look like they're leaning over. You know those buildings, they pay millions and millions of dollars. They're not leaning, they're perfectly straight up and down. But because the way cameras and lenses work, if you're not far enough away or you're not on the same plane, you're gonna get this kind of caving in look to your photos. And um, this can easily be fixed in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic and Camera Raw with geometry. So if I go to develop, in Lightroom Classic, it's actually called Transform, and everything else, on, even on your phone, it's called Geometry. So if I were to go in, I could say Auto, and see what Auto does, and Auto did a really good job. It kind of fixed it. But if Auto doesn't do a good job, you can do Guided. So Guided, um, hang on, let me reset it. Reset. Reset up right, there we go. Guided allows you to choose what should be straight. So this building should be straight, but it's not. So I'm just gonna drag out a guide and you need at least two guides. So there's the first guide, nothing happens because I need two. And then I drag out the second guide of what should be straight and then it will straighten it. Now in this case, this also results in a cropping necessity, but I could either scale the image up, which is what happened when you do auto. So I don't want that. What I want instead is I want to keep as much height as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and go um, get out of this and then go to um, cropping. And this way I can crop in from the sides, but not lose the height. So that's why sometimes even auto upright, I would still prefer to do it manually so that I get what I want as opposed to it cropping it the wrong way. Keystoning, yes, keystoning is the word. That is the actual name of the effect that you get. 
Okay, uh, let's do one more of those. So same thing here. Uh, this is GM Tower, downtown Detroit. It's almost straight. It's, it's just not quite straight. It's leaning in kind of mostly on one side. So if I go into um, Guide It, and I reset it so that you can see me do it. There we go. And I go in and do Guide It. I can say that this one, this tower is crooked. That should be straight. And this is the other side, which is almost kind of straight. I don't really need to do much. But it can use that one side to, to straighten the other side on. And so same thing, I could, since I've got more sky there, I could just scale up or I could just go in and manually crop and get it the way I want. All right, so that is upright. That's a feature I still use all the time. Can you auto fill those cropped areas? Not in Lightroom. You can do it in Photoshop, but not in Lightroom. Um, all right, next up. So many things, so little time. I'm already, uh, I'm gonna give it one or two more minutes because we did not give photo, or Lightroom its full half, half of the stream. But let's go ahead and do one or two more before we jump over to Photoshop. Let's go in and talk about presets. So presets are um, something that a lot of people take for granted because uh, in most cases you had to create your own. So if you wanted a photo to look a certain way, when you went into the develop module, you would go ahead and develop it the way you wanted it to look. So you would go in and, and do all the things to it and add maybe a little dehaze and just kind of um, add more, a little bit more contrast to this photo and kind of just really look at, make it look like nice and rich and detailed. And then if you wanted to do that again and again and again, you would head over to presets and create your own preset. That's great. So you create your own preset, um, deep look, deep look and save it to the user presets and you can tell it to uh, basically do all the things that could be done that you might have done to it so that all those things get saved except for maybe you also don't want you maybe you don't want it to do uh, where is it here maybe you don't want it to do I don't see it because I'm just looking over it. But you can turn off the things you don't want it to do. So for example, maybe I don't want it to do the effects and maybe I don't want it to do the upright stuff to it because maybe I did it manually. So I can turn that stuff off. Everything else gets done. When I save that as a preset, that becomes a preset in my user presets. However, let's reset this. Let's get it back to the way it was. However, um, Adobe has been working hard at giving you premium presets. So all of these presets that say style are ones that come with um, Lightroom and Lightroom Classic to let you have um, more choices if you're not an expert at creating your own presets. So for example, if I do subject landscape, I can just hover over these to kind of see, oh, yeah, I kind of like, maybe I like that one where it was really warm. I like that effect, let's say I do. And then when you click it, um, you get the ability to, uh, in other words, you can still do anything else you want to do to the photo, but now you basically have applied that particular preset. If you don't like it, you can go choose a different one. Uh, and of course, these are these are all, I don't know if they have any for uh, wildlife at this point. They don't. But you have presets that allow you to get a jump start on your photos by category so that you can um, not have to be an expert at creating these various looks. So for example, there's a black and white look I like for the zebras, uh, but if you want to choose a different look, you can. And there are some for portraits as well. So if you work with people most of the time, like I do, there's portraits deep skin, portraits medium skin, portraits light skin, that um, will help you get your the colors of your portraits looking better as well, skin tones especially. All right. Um, Constraint crop. Do I use do I use full what? <laughs> so, so the question is, Terry, do you use full? I don't know. Maybe full what? Um, all right, let's keep going. Dun, 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 dun. One more, and this is a biggie, and then I'll let it go. I'll move on. When you want to print, so let's say I want to print these three photos or these four photos, let's say, I wanna print these. If you were in Lightroom, you, you would have to export them. There is no, there's not even a, a print command in Lightroom, 
But in Lightroom Classic, there's a whole print module. So if I go to the print module, this is one of my favorite all-time features of Lightroom is that you can design what you want your prints to look like. Now, since I selected four photos and I'm on a one-page design, each photo is going to be set up on its own page. But I can go in and I can not only completely redesign what it's going to look like. So I could say, for example, uh, give me um, two rows and two columns so that all four photos will fit on the page. That's cute. But what I really like is the fact that you can really get into some design and artistic capabilities as well. So for example, maybe I want a fine art mat where the photo is lifted above it. And maybe I want to also have, um, let's go in and let's say that I also want to turn on my identity plate. And I'll move my identity plate down and I want my identity plate to be larger and I want that to be part of the print as well. I could also go in and adjust the cell width and height so that my border is around the image. And so that way, if we didn't show the guides, that's what my print would look like. It would actually look like something that you set up as a, as a Photoshop template or something that you set up to look in a very nice way. Uh, so you can go in, for example, I've got some presets here that I've been working on over the years. So let's see here. Maybe I want to do a four up gallery print. There we go. And in each one, the image can be moved around so that you get it just right. And then you can go ahead and these images, of course, haven't been adjusted, but you can go ahead and then print this out or export this out so that it can be printed by a professional printer. So which do I prefer, Lightroom or Lightroom Classic? I am a Lightroom Classic user because I, I use things like the print module that aren't in Lightroom. I use tethering that isn't in Lightroom. So for the reason that there are features I use every single day that don't exist in Lightroom, that keeps me being a Lightroom Classic user. All right, uh, next up. So I could, uh, more things I can show in Lightroom, but let's move on, otherwise we'll run out of Photoshop time. So let's head over, well, wait, one more, one more. Okay, one more really quickly, because this is a big one. Um, this is another reason why I like Lightroom Classic over Lightroom. Let's say I want these, these six photos to be adjusted the same, because they're from the same scene, they're just different photos. So in Lightroom Classic, if I select them and I have Auto Sync turned on down here in the bottom right, Auto Sync, then that means whatever adjustments I make will happen to all of the ones that are selected. So for example, if I do that auto tone, if I do that dehaze, if I do add a lot of vibrance to the photo, if I do add a lot of saturation to the photo, if I just make that, that really mountainous area look really rich and, and beautiful, I do that once and it's now happened to all the photos. So imagine, needing to do the same, even a simple adjustment, even one thing to 500 photos. Select 500 photos, do it once, and you've done it to 500 photos. This is the kind of speed and adjustments and things that just can't be matched by other pieces of software. Now, you can effectively do this in Lightroom, but you would have to do it to one photo, copy it, select the other 499, and hit paste. So it can't happen. It's just a copy and paste versus doing it live. All right, now let's head over to Photoshop. So switching gears, let's go to Photoshop. Let's get out of the home screen. Let's go to, I've got some libraries of images here that we can work on. Let's go to, oh, let's go in and choose row discretions. Is it in here? Nope, not that one. Sorry, folks. There's one particular photo I want to start off with. I thought I had it handy. And it's here. I'm just overlooking it. Dun, 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 dun. I'm just really overlooking it. Okay, we'll skip it. We'll go on to the next one. It's in here. I can do it here. Okay. All right, here's the photo I wanted. It was just, I thought I had it in a different spot. All right, so one of the things that 
I have um, used every single day <laughs> that I use Photoshop. I can't, there's not too many times where I open Photoshop and I don't use this tool because I'm doing a lot of retouching. And it is the spot healing tool. So my number one favorite tool in Photoshop of all time is the spot healing brush. So if we zoom in, we, we can see this kid's got some acne going on. And it's unfair that on school day, his acne was acting up. And really, that's not the way he really looks on a normal day. So let's fix that. And of course, we could duplicate the layer for those of you who freak out when you don't do that. All right, so let's go ahead and grab our spot healing tool. And what I love about it is it's a tool that is automatically just a brush. And when you use it, it uses the surrounding pixels to clone in to the part that you brushed. So if I just go ahead and brush that or just tap it, it's just using those surrounding pixels like magic to fix areas in a photo or retouch areas in a photo. So this just makes life so much easier, so much faster than trying to do this in Lightroom. In Lightroom, every time you would tap or brush, it would randomly pick a spot as opposed to the pixels that were right near it. And sometimes it guesses right. Most of the times it guesses, you know, not the best guess. And you would spend a lot of time having to go in and just fix it and change it and move it as opposed to me almost being done it would take you two to three times longer to do this in lightroom so this is the kind of stuff that if i need to do it once like one little thing i might do it in lightroom if i need to do a lot of it i'm going to come over to lightroom or photoshop and do it all so before after in just a few seconds so the um the full-on Spot healing brush, spot healing tool is my favorite. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't also like its, its sister or brother, which is the patch tool. So what I like about the spot healing tool is just the, way, just the way I used it. I can just tap or brush and boom, it's done. Now there is a healing brush that's, I believe it's underneath this one. There's a regular healing brush tool that works more like the clone stamp. This healing brush tool was first and therefore you have to um, sample, you have to choose an area to sample from. So you'd have to hold down your option key, click, and then it would go ahead and use that area. So sometimes you may need that. You may not want it to use the pixels surrounding, you may want it to use the pixels on, you know, nearby, but not the ones directly around it because maybe they're also, you know, bad pixels. So you can use both of those tools, but my favorite of all time is Spot Healing Brush. Now the patch tool, what I like about the patch tool as opposed to the healing brush, is it's kind of a cross between the healing brush and spot healing brush because it lets me select a big area or a small area, but choose where it's gonna be um, cloned or patched from. So for example, I could select these, these dark shadows under his eyes and I could say, okay, I can make a nice big selection. And I could say, well, where do I want it to pick up that, pick up and replace that from? as i drag i get a preview and that's my favorite feature about this tool is that i get to see what it's going to do before i do it now when i let go that will do it but it will make it look unnatural because like no one is like even a newborn <laughs> basically doesn't have any like very few people have nothing under their eye like unless it's been heavily made up or heavily retouched you're going to see something but what i like about the patch tool also is that it has a fade feature so that if I don't want to completely remove it, but I just want to reduce it, and I use this a lot, is I'll just go to Fade Patch Selection under Edit. That'll bring up a little window over here on my other monitor. There we go. And then I can go ahead and just dial it down. So it's like undo the patch tool on a slider. If I dial it down to zero, it goes all the way back to the, where it was. I can maybe take it up 50%, around 50% to remove half of the shadow, half of the darkness, not all of it, but like reducing it by half. All right, so then when I, as long as you don't deselect, before you use the patch, patch, I'm sorry, before you use fade, fade's available. If you deselect, fade is grayed out. So you have to do it while the patch has been done and is still selected. So same thing here, I let go, it's been done, I have not deselected. As long as I haven't deselected, fade patch is there. Once you deselect, fade patch will be gone. All right, so again, I can dial it back down and just re reduce it. I can take it all the way down, bring it all the way back, or just reduce it quite a bit to where it's not as noticeable. That way, it still looks natural, still looks like he's got stuff under his eye, but it's nowhere near as much. 
Um, <laughs> Ozzy's like, I'm just reading your comment. Would your second uh, best tool be the patch tool? Yep, I'm kind of doing them in order. All right, um, my next one. Let's close this guy. Let's go back. And let's go ahead and we're going to come back to those. Let's go ahead and choose. I've got one here. You know what? Let's just do it from Lightroom. Let's go to Lightroom and let's go ahead and choose. We're still looking at mountains, right? Let's go here. Let's go here. And let's go here. All right, edit. So I just went back to Lightroom to, to get this photo. Um, nothing to do with Lightroom. I just knew that's where the photo was. So my uh, third favorite feature is the new select subject. So we had masking 2.0 in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, which has a select subject, which is great for masking. But you also have that same capability in, um, you had it first in, in Photoshop. And it's under select. You just choose select subject, it figures out what the subject is, and it makes a beautiful selection in most cases around your entire subject. Again, it's AI, it may miss stuff, you may have to fix it, but more often than not, it does a really good job of selecting. So, that's number four, select subject. But also, number five, is the select and mask workspace. So, because um, the selection may not be perfect, you have select and mask so that you can go ahead and refine it. So if I go up to my select menu again and choose select and mask after I've made a selection, then I will get the select and mask workspace that comes up. There it is. And it shows me what I would get if I were to choose the selection. Now, now I can see what things it missed, like it missed between her shoes. It like looks, looks like it missed part of her shoulder here. And that's why I go into the select and mask workspace to see if this is the selection I'm going to get. You can choose the different views, so you can see it as an overlay. You can see it, uh, which of course the overlay is red, so that doesn't really help me. I can see it on black. I can see it on white. I can see it um, on layers, which means show me the transparency. And you can see it as a mask, so you can really see how the hair looks, so forth and so on. But uh, if you already had your, your new layer behind it, showing it on layers would let you see what that would look like as well. So for example, let's get out of this for a second just to teach you something here. Let's, uh, let's pretend we didn't do any of that, deselect. Let's turn this into a layer. Let's go back to our libraries here. And let's go here. And let's say we like this, uh, this three, three, three dimensional look here. So we'll just drag this down, or maybe not. Maybe not. Let's open it and then drag it over this way. There we go. We'll pull it down. Uh, before we do that, undo. Let's make it the right size. Hold down our option key so it does it from the center out. There we go. And now we'll lock that in and pull it down. Okay, so now we've got that layer behind it. So we would see what it looks like when we do this. So let's do it one more time. Select subject. And let's go ahead and select a mask. Did I do it? Yeah, it's doing it. And now we see it on the background that it's going to be on. So that red will show up even better because we know it's going to be on a white background. We can see the pieces that are missing, so forth and so on. And now that you can see what's what didn't get selected properly, you can go in and fix it. So for example, there are different brush tools. There's the Refine Edge tool, which I would use around the hair, because I can see some of the hair is a little messed up there. But I also have the regular brush tool, which works as a uh, add or subtract kind of selection tool. So for example, if I just go ahead and add this back in, and just brush it back in. That's one way to do it. But you can't see what you're necessarily doing, so you might spend a lot of time adding and subtracting just to kind of get it right. And here, same thing, it's missing that little piece of arm. Now, if we scroll down here, same thing with the shoes. I can hold down my Option or Alt key and kind of mask that back out. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to use that Refine Edge brush. And if we make that brush bigger, we can start on what used to be the red background, which is here, 
and then we can go ahead and just kind of paint in between here and let it recalculate and it didn't do a great job on that but I can see what it's kind of trying to do here so I can let just go ahead and do one more time uh, hang on oops undo make my brush smaller there we go. and then I can go ahead and refine that more with the other brush tool so I can say oh no 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 we need our feet let's bring our feet back now I would take my time and go in and do a really good job and even if I miss something, it's creating a mass, so I can always go back in and redo it or refix it. So I'm not doing the best job there, but you get the idea. And then we come up here to the hair. We go to that Refine Edge Tool brush, and we can kind of bring back any hair that should be there and let it recalculate. Although it's not doing the best job here, let's do Refine Hair. That's even worse. Let's do color aware. All right. You have a choice between color aware and object aware. So sometimes, depending on which mode you're in, you may get better results. So let's try that again. And I am not getting good results on this. I'm going to spend a ton more time on this. Let's put some of this back in manually. And then we would come back in and keep working on those edges. I think it just missed a big clunk of hair and it didn't know what to do with it. All right. It's like a puzzle. It's going to bug me until I get it just right. But anyway, uh, I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but I would then go in and kind of refine those edges better. And I'm not sure why I keep getting that, but normally it works great. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and just say that I want to output this as a new layer with a mask so I can always come back to it and keep working on it. Now I've got the original layer. I've got the new layer with a mask. And if I double click on the mask, I get right back to selected mask so I can keep working and getting that hair just right. But it saves a lot of time, most of the time, when I'm doing selected mask. All right, next up, let's do um, sky replacement. So let's get out of this. Let's go back to Lightroom. And let's go to this one, for example. So sky is completely blown out and the sky is also disconnected from um, the sky because of this hole in the mountain here. So if I were to go into edit and choose sky replacement, uh, it figures out what the sky is and lets me replace it with a better looking sky. So same thing here. I get to pick what skies I want to use. So the blue sky, spectacular sunsets and night skies are the ones that come from Adobe, but you can also upload your own sky so these these terry skies are mine and i can pick and choose which ones of those i want to try as well and i kind of like that one that cloudy one this one might look cool too but you kind of want a sky that's going to match what you're looking at so the overcast sky may not be a good one here even though it was overcast that day that's why the sky is completely white um, that may be a better look but um, you may just also want to go for something different. So you might want uh, to change the look of the sky to be more like that. And then you can, of course, drag it around and scale it to get it where you want it to be in the scene. So if, it's, if I need to pull it down more, I would just scale the sky up um, so that it's bigger and fills up that part at the top. And there's also, it looks like a little bit of... Uh, edge fading going on it's a little too much there so let's pull that back a little bit there we go and once i click ok on that that new sky becomes a layer group that i can always turn off turn on get right back to so it's it's a non-destructive thing there um all right next up got like one minute left 
the next one is gonna be I'm gonna show you an old old one I was gonna say an old school one but an old one that um, we've had for years and years and years but we don't really show it off we don't really show it off anymore and let's go ahead and open up this downtown scene. And you, if you zoom in, you would see that this says the word school way back there. Well, let's say I need another school right here or right here. Well, you could type the word school. So let's go ahead and do that. And school looks funny in all caps. But anyway, there's the word school. And then I could try and... Um, uh, turn into a smart object and distort it and try and make it look right. But I also have the option to use vanishing point. So if I were to just simply select that, those pixels, copy them, deselect, turn that layer off, create a new layer, and then go into the filter menu and come down to vanishing point. And really quickly, I can draw out my guides for what the street's supposed to look like. So from there to there to there. And if you don't get it just right, it'll turn red like it just did. And then you can adjust it until it turns blue. So then you know your vanishing point's correct. Now I can do a paste. That'll paste in the word school. I'm not sure why it was like that. Anyway, you can free transform it and scale it down. And my school's huge, so it's going to take a while to scale it down. But anyway, you would lay it down on the street. And I'm out of time. But anyway, let's say that was small enough. I would lay it down. And then because it's its own layer, I could go in and now use um, the blend if controls for layering to kind of make that look more natural by blending it in. And I'm out of time here, but let's go ahead and try this real quick. Something like that. So it doesn't look like it's brand new, fresh painted. It looks like it's been on the street for a while. All right, folks, I'm out of time. I've already been cut off on Adobe. <music> Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll catch you next week here again on a Friday where I will try and keep it within the hour. Bye, everybody.